Karen, good to see you, if only over Zoom. I know you've been to Bloomington in the past, and I believe we also last met at a conference in Vienna. Next time, God willing, it'll be in person. Anyway, for now, we're happy to have you in our series. This is a very busy week for us because in addition to the program today, we're also doing a program, a webinar program this Wednesday, featuring a major presentation by Rabbi David Wolpe of Los Angeles, uh, one of America's leading rabbis who also pays very close attention to the matters uh, before us. Um, Karin Stegner, uh, teaches as a professor of sociology at the University of Passau. She did her PhD and her habilitation, the advanced degree after the PhD uh, at the University in Vienna. She specializes in um, fields relating to feminism, critical theory, and anti-Semitism. She has published significant work on the connections among these three, uh, both in German and in English. For those of you who would like to link up with some of her work in English, I'm sure that after this program, we can send you links to her articles that are well worth reading. I call your attention in particular to a piece entitled Antisemitism and Intersectional Feminism, Strange Alliances, another one entitled New Challenges in Feminism, Intersectionality, Critical Theory, and Anti-Zionism. And the topics that she deals with in those two articles and elsewhere in her publications go right to the heart of what she's going to be speaking to us about today, there's a very strange alliances taking place intersectionally among groups that otherwise would have little if anything to do with one another, but they tend to unite uh, at times very strangely and malevolently even when it comes to questions of Zionism, Jews in Israel. But enough from me about that. Karin, it's now my pleasure to turn over to you. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, Elvin and Günther, for inviting me to this uh, really very, very interesting and prominent lecture series. Um, I will talk about uh, intersectionality and uh, the relation between intersectionality and anti-Semitism. And I think this question is relevant, particularly against the background that the concept uh, of intersectionality has steadily gained influence since the 1990s. Um, I mean, there is no, almost no uh, feminist circumstance or anti-racist circumstance where it's not also about intersectionality. Um, intersectionality functions, in theory, I mean, functions as a basis for global solidarity in many Western uh, feminist movements. And uh, I mean, in the sense that feminists ought not turn a blind eye to other forms of oppression. So an intersectional view recognizes that in modern society, different forms of oppression and discrimination occur simultaneously rather than separately that uh, these different kinds and different forms of oppression are mutually entangled and that social categories like gender, race and class must be analyzed as intertwining social processes. So, I mean, this is the basic of intersectional theory, uh, which uh, probably uh, many uh, among you already know. Uh, and this is obvious. Not so obvious, however, is which forms of oppression find entry into the intersectionality framework. Most often the spectrum is tied back to the classical triad, race, class, and gender. And more recently, it's also uh, centrally about sexuality. It's maybe about age, ability, uh, or about um, discrimination on the grounds of religion or on the grounds of political conviction and so on. Whereas anti-Semitism, and this is really 
this is really interesting. Antisemitism is rarely considered. Um, one reason for such omission is that antisemitism is often simply subsumed under racism. This subsumption, however, hides the specificity of antisemitic ideology and thus makes it undetectable. In addition, however, um, there also is an ideological side to it. It's uh, an anti-Zionist political agenda that becomes effective here. In recent years, the concept of intersectionality has therefore increasingly been contested since it does not only commonly exclude anti-Semitism from its analytical framework, but sometimes it even serves as an ideological background for prolif proliferating Israel hatred. An ideological anti-Zionism has become a cultural code in the mainstream of anti-racist intersectionality. And activists in these uh, anti-racist movements uh, apply or tend to apply, apply double standards when they defame women's and LGBTIQ rights in Israel as pinkwashing or as homonationalism. So this often happens from an exclusively Western point of view and in complete disregard of the actual struggles of Palestinian but also of Israeli queers for their sexual self-determination. So against that background, the question arises to what extent a gender sensitive and feminist critique of antisemitism can rightfully and reasonably refer to intersectionality. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I will elaborate on the tension between intersectionality and antisemitism. And first I will contrast antisemitism and racism because I think this is really central to the problem. And in a second step, I will delineate the reasons for intersectionality excluding antisemitism from its analytical frame. However, I do not only want to present the pitfalls of intersectionality concerning antisemitism, but I also want to elaborate on in intersectionality as a possible tool to analyze antisemitism. So as it were, as a feminist critical theorist, I want to present a rescuing critique of intersectionality that tries to safeguard those moments within intersectionality, which we can integrate into a feminist critique of antisemitism. So thirdly, and finally, I will go on to develop a specific approach to intersectionality that views ideologies in relation to each other and that reads antisemitism itself as an intersectional ideology. So but let me come to my first point. It's uh, the contrast uh, between antisemitism and racism, the relationship between antisemitism and racism, which is indeed a complex relationship of similarity and difference. And I think that the difficulties in analyzing antisemitism within the intersectionality paradigm arise to a large extent from the widespread misunderstanding that antisemitism was merely a form of racism. And this is a misunderstanding because historically, as well as nowadays, antisemitism has always been a distinctive ideology. It cannot be reduced to racism any more than homophobia, for example, can be reduced to sexism. But at the same time, and this is the complex situation, antisemitism is not entirely different from racism, just as homophobia and sexism are connected ideologies. So we fail to grasp antisemitism's complexity if we see it only as a form of racism. But on the other hand, we will not understand it either if we do not also recognize it as racist. It is important to view antisemitism and racism as closely related, though different ideologies. And I would like to go a little bit into detail concerning this um, this complex relationship, because there is no doubt that antisemitism operates with numerous racist elements that moved into the foreground in the 19th century. Then the traditional religious form of anti-Judaism was replaced by a secular and pseudo-scientific concept of race. In the eyes of the anti-Semites, Jews were Jews, even if they converted to Christianity. So it was nothing about religion anymore. And this shift became evident particularly in anti-Semitic body images 
that depicted Jews as weak, sick, filthy, decadent, and ugly, yet inferior to the so-called Aryan body. This anti-Semitic imaginary has anti-Semitic and sexist imaginary, one, one must add, has much to do with how nature is viewed and embedded in society as body images always also bear the social meaning of nature or what is perceived as natural. So this is indeed an interesting issue in the case of antisemitism, and we see here a difference to racism. While racists ascribe to those whom they discriminate against and whom they exploit a form of primitive nature, this is different in antisemitism. Because here in antisemitism, it is not directly nature being ascribed to Jews, but rather a lack of naturalness and a lack of strength. And hence, they are, Jews are ascribed with an artificiality that would make them inferior to non-Jews. Images like flat feet, physical weakness, lacking physical vitality, and so on, are common anti-Semitic tropes which have a very long tradition back into the 19th century. So Jews are hated, not because of an assumed closeness to nature, but the other way around. The Jewish body was considered inferior because of a purported lack of nature and instead a surplus and an overflow of civilization. Thus, racism is unquestionably an important moment for the functioning of antisemitism as a modern ideology but it works differently. It works somehow turned upside down so that many of those stereotypes that we know from racism, like closeness to nature, are actually positively turned and applied to the non-Jews, while Jews are accused of lacking any authentic feeling for nature. This inversion is certainly an important characteristic of antisemitism, but however, not the only one because modern antisemitism operates substantially on the basis of a distorted perception of capitalist relations of production and their logic of exploitation. Antisemitism tries to reduce the complexity of supra-individual social and economic processes by inventing figures like the greedy Jew, the Jewish banker, or the Jewish conspirator. And these figures are held responsible for capitalist exploitation and abstract power relations. And this in turn is regularly combined with an anti-intellectualism that fears in Jews a subversive and disintegrating spirit. So that we can say that eventually anti-Semitism is essentially about the rejection of spirit and money and not so much about the exploitation of nature, which is in the foreground in, uh, in racism. So the differences between anti-Semitism and racism seem to be clear, both colonial and apartheid racism is based on, the, on a hierarchical construction of supposedly superior and inferior races. The racial other that is constructed as primitive and as inferior represents in the racist point of view, a primitive closeness to nature and a lack of civilization and modernity. While the racists themselves consider themselves as representatives of civilization. And here in these uh, racist, uh, racist relations are conspiracy theories, conspiracy myths absent. They are not usually part of uh, racist uh, ideology. Conspiracy myths presuming that people of color uh, or colonized people secretly rule the world, that they secretly control the media and finance that they accelerate the, process, uh, the processes of modernization, globalization and cosmopolitanism is not part of, ideal, of racist ideology. But these conspiracy myths are an essential feature of antisemitism. Antisemitism which suspects an intangible power resides among Jews, one that is ubiquitous and to which antisemites do not feel superior but rather inferior. So 
choose, and this is the very ambiguous thing with antisemitism, that Jews are viewed as inferior and superior at once. It isn't just turned around, it's really both in one stereotype. They are regarded as inferior in their bodies and superior in their spirit and power. And these contradictory notions merged into one stereotype of Jewish cunningness and Jewish conspiracy. And I'm pretty sure that these ambiguities add to the difficulties, particularly parts of the left have in understanding how anti-Semitism actually works. And also many intersectional feminists who stand up against racism share this difficulty. They usually reduce racism to the dichotomy of white and black, with Jews implicitly or explicitly identified with whiteness. So they can easily be left out of the anti-racist struggle. Once Jewish Israelis, for example, have been defined as representatives of white hegemony, it becomes logical to deny them the special interests of a global minority deserving anti-racist support. Then anti-Semitism can be viewed as an intra-white problem and the Shoah even as a white on white crime. Anti-Semitism and the Shoah thus fall outside the range of intersectional relevance because they cannot be interpreted in terms of the color line. Since Jews are considered white, there is no need to make room for considering anti-Semitism within the intersectionality framework. But we know that anti-Semitism does not run along the color line and consequently not along the binary divide privileged or non-privileged. Jews are not whites in the sense of what whiteness and privilege frames imply, namely being the norm and thereby being invisible and probably most importantly, safe. So the whiteness frame as a tool for making visible structural racism uh, not only proves to be completely unsuitable for an analysis of antisemitism, but can even confirm antisemitism, as David Schraub has convincingly pointed out. The, he pointed uh, to the fact that the privileges associated with whiteness include power, influence, money, property, education, dominance, participation, being heard and having a voice, having clicks and networks, and having positions inherited over generations. So this might uh, describe the, uh, the white hegemony indeed. But if this frame is applied to the Jewish minority, it can actually result in the confirmation of anti-Semitic stereotypes, such as the excessive influence of Jews in business, politics, and the media. As David Schraub argues, Jews appear as the super whites in this framework, and thus, they can become a target of anti-racist activism. That anti-Semitism falls outside the framework of racism studies is basically due to a double reduction. Firstly, anti-Semitism is being reduced to a mere form of racism. And secondly, racism itself is being reduced to the color line. As a result, contemporary antisemitism, one that is related to Israel, does not appear anymore because it doesn't fit in. As Robert Fine prominently pointed out, a musealization of antisemitism is going on. Only the super racist forms of the National Socialist past are being recognized. While current forms of antisemitism that do not in the first place operate on a traditionally racist level, like an antisemitism related to Israel, these forms regularly go unrecognized. In fact, while antisemitism and racism are historically closely related, they have developed in different directions after the Shoah and in postcolonial contexts. But even today, it becomes evident that antisemitism is also a form of racism, as Daniel Bedil in his book, Jews Don't Count, demonstrates by means of a lot of examples. Jews suffer from discrimination, harassment, and hatred, which would rightfully be considered racist if they were directed against ethnic minorities other than Jews. Take, for example, the debate around how to define antisemitism. 
Here we observe a dispute between basically two positions. The IRA definition, which includes the notion of Israel-related antisemitism on the one hand, and the so-called Jerusalem Declaration, which does not actually define antisemitism, but which rather lists all sorts of attitudes which shall be considered as a mere critique of Israel and thus not as anti-Semitic. Now, imagine a group of people, most of them not even theorists and critics of racism, but intellectuals of any kind and any background, coming together to write down a definition of racism. And actually, in the first place, agreeing on what is not to be considered as racist, but rather as a legitimate critique. I think that such a declaration would rightfully be considered as itself racist or as promoting and playing down racism. So Israel-related antisemitism can even be regarded as oppositional to racism since the alleged intention is an anti-imperialist one. And we see here, we face here an anti-Zionist drift, an ideological anti-Zionism that has nothing to do with Zionism, that is not a reaction to Zionism, as uh, David Seymour has pointed out in his seminal articles on this topic. So in face of the Israel-related antisemitism, it is wrong to conflate antisemitism with racism, but it is also wrong to exaggerate the distinction of racism and antisemitism. I think it's really all about mediation to see the continuity within the discontinuity. So, but what does this all have to do with intersectionality? I come to my second point, why intersectionality often excludes the analysis of antisemitism. Intersectionality, as we know, uses the framework of race, class, and gender for analyzing in what ways members of minorities are affected by discrimination, by domination, and by exploitation. We have seen that Jews and antisemitism cannot be sufficiently grasped with the analytical tools of critical race studies particularly the whiteness frame. And in my view, this is one of the major reasons why intersectionality does not recognize antisemitism. Antisemitism is a specific and very ambiguous ideology, as we have seen, and it pushes the Jews beyond the stable categories of intersectionality. So not only in regard of the race category of the white and black binary are Jews not assignable, but also with regard to the other categories that are central to the intersectionality frame, namely gender and sexuality and class. I would like to elaborate a little bit on this ambiguous character of antisemitism. We see that our societies are organized along clear binary markers, such as belonging versus not belonging, white versus black, male versus female, hetero versus lesbian gay, inside versus outside, and so on. And these markers are repressively and exclusively assigned to individuals in racism, sexism, homophobia, nationalism, and ethnocentrism. These ideologies position persons of color, women, gays, and lesbians, foreigners, and strangers unambiguously along the binary codes usually on the less powerful side. The categories are constructed strictly so that in this perspective, it is simply not possible to move from one side to the other, for example, from female to male or from black to white, to make categories fluid as is being done in, 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 in queer circumstances, for example. This is usually perceived as a profound threat to the whole order. But antisemitism, by contrast, is itself characterized by ambivalence with regard to these markers. It does not position Jews unambiguously on one or the other side of this binary, but rather attributes to choose a position beyond binary categorization. The history of antisemitism shows that Jews are regarded as unclassifiable in the three dimensions that are central to the classical intersectionality approach gender, sexuality, class, and race, slash ethnicity, 
slash nation. So choose not do not only fall out of the category of race, but also of the other two categories central to the intersectionality frame, namely gender and class. Countless are the images, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century, which ascribed an ambiguous gender and an ambiguous sexuality to Jews. Antisemitism traditionally considered Jewish men to be effeminate and Jewish women to be masculinized. They were said to blur the clearly drawn boundaries between the genders, to dissolve a clear cut gender identity and to reverse gender roles and the gender specific division of labor. You see the whole order is being threatened um, here. And consequently, women's emancipation was also interpreted as a Jewish machination against the unity of the people. It is this intermediate position regarding gender and sexuality that is attributed to Jews. Um, what it, this is why they were seen as an essential threat to the unity of the cultural community. Because this unity is still inseparably linked to the heteronormative order also today. We can see this particularly in the extreme right-wing anti-gender ideologies, which are always also anti-Semitic. So this is uh, the ambiguity with the category of gender and sexuality. And we also see an ambiguity in the case of the category of class. Also, this is also not distinctive with regard to truth. One major characteristic of antisemitism's classical inventory is that Jews are identified with the intermediary, intermediary economic sphere of circulation, meaning with trade, banking, and money transactions. The position of the trader is an intermediate one that makes the class position appear ambiguous and vague. Jews were neither masters nor servants. They belonged neither to the bourgeoisie nor to the proletariat. So if they attributed themselves to the class of the bourgeois, they encountered the cliche of the misfit bourgeois a bourgeois who would only imitate the capitalist business while lacking any feeling for real and sincere entrepreneurship. They therefore represent solely the negative effects of capitalism. And on uh, the other way around, as the voice of the working class, Jews were seen as hypocrites, speaking from a position alienated from all physical labor about things they knew nothing about. So the stereotype of the class traitor is very common in antisemitism. Antisemitism is a particular fear that the unity and identity of the nation, of the religion, of culture, or whatever, might be infiltrated and decomposed. Conspiracy myths are a manifestation of this fear. In this context, Jews do not represent a foreign or a hostile identity, but rather an anti-identity, meaning the dissolvent of fixed boundaries of collective or cultural identities. Here, a difference to newer forms of racism, like cultural racism, becomes clear. Take, for example, the anti-Muslim resentment that ascribes to Muslims um, a hermetically sealed and fixed identity. And sometimes it seems that the anti-Muslim racists even envy the Muslims for their purported fixed identity. It is all about him homogeneity. In antisemitism, by contrast, Jews are characterized as lacking identity or roots altogether. This is also evident in the national socialist mania which viewed Jews not as an alien race that was to be subjugated and exploited, but as an anti-race, the negative principle as such on which extermination, uh, the salvation of the world was to depend as Horkheimer and Adorno famously analyzed in the famous book, Dialectic of Enlightenment. The mania of redemption through exterminatory antisemitism emerged from a view of Jews as settled in a non-place beyond the authoritative categorical order of the world. Hence the stereotype of Jews disintegrating national or whatever communities. 
I think that it is due to this anti-categorical character of anti-Semitism that it is so hard to grasp, uh, to, be, to grasp it by dominant intersectional approaches. Because dominant intersectional approaches assume and analyze the interdependence of stable categories. Antisemitism denies Jews any clear categorization and derives its effectiveness and efficiency from almost queer thwarting of familiar binaries and from undermining clear categorizations. So while intersectionality depends on clear categorizations, antisemitism um, towards these categorizations, this clear categorization. Jews are not assignable to race, class, or gender because antisemitism itself blurs these categories and portrays the Jews as not belonging to any identity criteria. These analytic difficulties of grasping antisemitism in the intersectionality frame seem to translate more and more into growing political abuse of the concept of intersectionality in numerous feminist and anti-racist movements. To give you one recent example, I want to refer to the US-based Palestine feminist collective that advocates a, let me quote, truly intersectional and decolonial feminist vision for the United States, Palestine, and our world, end of quote. In 2021, in the wake of the Gaza war, the collective declared that Palestine is a feminist issue, thereby exclusively referring to the occupation of the West Bank by Israel. Not a single word was said about, about sexism and homophobia within Palestine, which we would expect from feminists actually. So the slogan, Palestine is a feminist issue, turns into a manifestation of an anti-Zionism that turns feminism on its head because it is stripped of any critique of the anti-feminism, sexism, homophobia, and not least anti-Semitism deeply entrenched in Palestinian society and exerted daily by the Palestinian authorities, by Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. The problem goes indeed deep and reveals the structural antisemitism that permeates the whole argumentation. The idea of Palestine is completely void of any concrete political and historical content. It is held pure of any contradictory conflict within. It's an, the idea is completely homogeneous. Palestine is imagined and personalized as the epitome of a pure victim of universal evil. And this universal evil in the form of imperialism, capitalism, racism, and sexism, and homophobia is explicitly identified with Israel. In this perspective, a liberated Palestine would eventually amount to a liberated humanity. As the Palestine Feminist Collective puts it, let me quote, we are reimagining and recreating a world free from systems of gendered, racial, and economic exploitation that commodify human life and land. Ours is a vision for a radically different future based on life affirming interconnectedness, empowering the working classes, and love for each other, land, life, and the planet itself. For these reasons, we pledge today and every day to recognize Palestine as a feminist issue and to uphold this commitment in our daily lives and organizing praxis." End of quote. So here, the fight against Israel is connected to a worldwide fight against capitalism and commodification in which the planet itself is at stake. Victory over Israel would imply a radically different future, not only for Palestine, but for the whole planet. This argumentation corresponds to the classic anti-Semitic ideology that the Jews would embody all the world's misfortunes and goes even further by implying that the world can only be freed from its evils by destroying Israel. This interpretation that it's about the destruction of Israel is supported by the fact that the Palestinian feminist collective does not make clear whether a free Palestine refers to the Palestinian areas within the 1967 borders or some broader geographical area that includes 
existing Israeli territory. So it's not clear whether they are calling for a two-state solution or the destruction of Israel. And in my view, it comes near to the latter interpretation when we read of the state of Israel as a colonial settler state and that drives Palestinians from their homes and denies them the right to return home. This is in accordance with the key actors in the Palestinian conflict advocating a Palestine from the river to the sea, which means the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state and so the end of Israel as a possible safe haven for the Jews worldwide. After all, one might not be too concerned by the Palestinian feminist collective if it weren't for more than 250 women's studies programs and other organizations, and more than 4,000 individuals in the United States, but also elsewhere, to endorse this pledge that Palestine is a feminist issue in 2021. This pledge was sent out on uh, the occasion of the Gaza war in May 2021, and only it addresses the destruction of Palestinian homes in Sheikh Jarrah, whereas the thousands of missiles that the Hamas and Islamic Jihad provided mainly by the Iranian regime fired from the Gaza Strip targeting Israel were not mentioned at all. So in face of these difficulties in the relationship between intersectionality and antisemitism, and in face of the political misuse of intersectionality, many scholars of antisemitism completely reject the concept, and we might say rightfully so. But I'm convinced that this is actually the wrong way. And with this, I come to my third and last point, how to prevent that intersectionality turns against Jews. First of all, as a feminist, I argue for a critical reclaiming of the concept of intersectionality. I do this because intersectionality has, has become so important in feminist academic and political discourses that one cannot avoid positioning oneself in this field. And secondly, I think that intersectionality has indeed got a, uh, uh, an explanatory force uh, in regard of uh, the analysis of uh, domination, of exploitation, and so on. So I think we need to um, think about how to uh, reclaim intersectionality. And here it is good to develop an, an understanding of intersectionality that not only avoids the pitfalls described above with regard to antisemitism, but that actively works against them and reconceptualizes intersectionality as a tool to analyze ideologies. Hence, a critical analysis of antisemitism itself opens the view of its own intersectional structure. Thus, there are ways of fruitfully thinking together intersectionality and the critique of antisemitism. And this is the last point that I want to elaborate on a little. A closer look at the history of sociological and social psychological theorizing shows that the early critical theory of the Frankfurt School linked the critique of antisemitism to a critique of gender and class relations. Thus, in some aspects, Adorno and Horkheimer anticipated later conceptions of intersectionality. In the broad empirical studies, authoritarian personality from the 1940s, they concluded that, ideo that, that ideologies such as antisemitism, racism, sexism, homophobia, ethnocentrism, nationalism, and class bias rarely occur isolated from each other. But they rather develop within a broader framework, and this broader framework they called the authoritarian ideological attitudinal syndrome. The authoritarian ideological at attitudinal syndrome. This is the larger framework um, within which ideologies dynamically buttress, mutually overlap, and strengthen one another. They take on a specific inner penetrative and interblending form from which each of these ideologies derives the tough and flexible effectiveness. So following this seminal insight, ideologies are indeed intersectional, they themselves. They interpenetrate and reinforce each other, constantly reforming and reactivating themselves in this process. 
Moreover, depending on political expediency and opportunity, one ideology may come to the fore, while the, other con the others continue to operate in the background or under the surface and can be recalled and reactivated at any time. This makes evident that ideologies are mobile and processual uh, social phenomena and not fixed entities. So referring to the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, I have developed the concept of the intersectionality of ideologies. And with this, I want to answer the questions, for example, how does antisemitism operate with sexist, racist, and nationalist moments? Or how do antisemitic motives shine through in antifeminism? Or how, do, how does nationalism or anti-genderism as a specific form of antifeminism mask latent antisemitism. However, when I'm talking about the intersectionality of ideologies, I do not mean to equate ideologies or to view ideologies as simply interchangeable. Rather, um, following Oskar Nicht uh, in the critique of ideologies, discernment as well as a sense of relationality must be developed then it becomes recognizable that ideologies gain their specificity precisely from the interplay with other ideologies. Such an approach helps us better understand the socio-historical structure, not only of antisemitism, but also of antifeminism, sexism, racism, or nationalism. This entails an important change of perspective in intersectionality research from the level of identity formation which is often in the foreground today, to the level of the ideological concealment of social contradictions and conflicts. And now, why do I see antisemitism as a thoroughly intersectional ideology? I mean that it integrates and operates through moments that may not in themselves appear antisemitic but which are sexist, homophobic, racist, nationalist, and so on. Thus, in antisemitism, we find innumerable images of deficient physicality, as I already demonstrated, um, that are these uh, deficient, these images of deficient physicality are meant to express a lack of masculinity um, in Jewish men and a lack of femininity in Jewish women. And this insinuates that Jews undermine the ruling heteronormative gender order. Such overlaps between antisemitism and sexism also make it possible for antisemitism to be overlaid with a form of anti-genderism in circumstances where the socio-political structure has made antisemitism a taboo. In these cases, feminism and women's emancipation are still viewed as surreptitiously as a Jewish machination against the non-Jewish communities. We can see this in uh, extreme right-wing discourse. Moreover, overlaps with racism are also clear in antisemitism, and the same goes for nationalism and the figure of the anti-national Jew who threatens the national principle per se. And similarly, anti-Zionism as a specific form of anti-nationalism may conceal antisemitism. And on top of all this, antisemitism provides a distorted reflection of the class antagonism, often masking itself as a critique of capitalism and imperialism, while viewing Jews as representing both Bolshevism and capitalism at one and the same time. The fact that the guilt for capitalist exploitation is thrown onto the Jews and that they are identified with the abstract side of the capital relation, that of free floating finance capital, is a further permanent component of the anti-Semitic ideology. So we see a multi-layered fusion with other ideologies. And via this multi-layered fusion, anti-Semitism represents a comprehensive and solidified worldview. It achieves this feature by intersectionally integrating moments of other ideologies. This specific intersection of ideological cliches gives antisemitism its potency as a comprehensive worldview that conceals the real conflicts and antagonism. So against that background, I consider antisemitism to be the quintessential intersectional ideology. So to sum up, 
there are, I think, ways of integrating anti-Semitism into an intersectionality framework. And I think that an intersectional ideology critique is an appropriate answer to the political misuse of intersectionality. I thank you very much for uh, your attention and I'm look very much looking forward to your questions and comments. Karin, thank you so much um, for this very rich uh, talk. I think um, we can um, discuss uh, this now for 30 minutes. Um, those of you who are on the call who want to join us for the discussion, please raise your hand and I will make you a co-panelist. You can do that with this little raise hand button, usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, then keep, keep your questions, please, under two minutes and please refrain from purely uh, partisan statements. We want to keep this a uh, non-partisan platform. The chat is also enabled now and we will discuss as much as possible then from the chat. But for, before we start um, taking questions also from the audience, um, Karen, I think you, um, at, at one point you said anti-Zionism has become a cultural code, uh, referring I think indirectly to um, Shulamit, um, Shulamit Volkov, who, um, who said something along these lines about anti-Semitism at the beginning of the 20th century. So has that, do you see that in, in what sectors do you see that? Is that something that you see a lot in people who refer to intersectionality, um, perhaps more than others? Um, that's one question. The other question I have, um, you said the intersectionality depends on clear categorization, if I understood you correctly. Um, but I see a lot, um, of um, discourse uh, among those who refer to intersectionality in trying to um, see more fluidity, for example, between genders. So is that really the case that there is this, this um, dichotomy or, um, that, you, that you said? Um, and so maybe it helps if you could explain to us what do you mean by intersectionality? Is that a framework of theory? Is that a political movement? Or how do you see that? <laughs> what is intersectionality if you use that? And as, I, uh, as you made it clear, you want to reclaim <laughs> it in a way that, um, that we can use it positively. And I assume that uh, we can even um, use it to understand better anti-Semitism, maybe even to fight anti-Semitism. But if we could elaborate a little bit on these questions while I invite more of the people to the to the panel then. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Günther, for these um, important questions. Uh, first, to the cultural code thing. Yes, indeed, I was referring to uh, that uh, uh, quote from Shulamit Volkov, uh, who uh, said that, uh, from, the, from the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, anti-Semitism as well as anti-feminism were um, cultural codes. And if you were in favor of anti-Semitism, you, uh, or if you belong to a certain social group, you were quasi automatically also in favor of anti-Semitism and in favor of anti-feminism. And my impression is that there are certain um, groups and not groups in the sociological sense, but groups uh, in, in the sense of platforms, in the sense of campaigns, in the sense of uh, movements, and that are anti-racist, whose self-understanding is anti-racist and feminist, and in this, and anti-imperialist, and in this very self-understanding, it has become very common to view Israel as a global perpetrator. Uh, as a racist global perpetrator, as a capitalist global perpetrator. And in that sense, and, and, and uh, I see this with uh, when I'm talking to, I don't know, students or young people who are in favor of these ideologies, um, they are not really informed about what is actually going on in Israel. They don't have 
really proper ideas uh, about the Middle East conflict. They don't have proper knowledge about the history of the region and so on. So it's really very, very, very ideological, uh, um, this uh, circumstance. And this, in that sense, I mean, it's a cultural code because as soon as you say these things, those people um, are connected. And they don't uh, even uh, question their ideologies anymore. So it is, in, in that sense, a cultural code that has um, um, that has become uh, self-sufficient. Um, so this on the cultural code question, the intersectionality question, in turn, is way more complex complicated. But thanks anyway for asking this. Um, so clear categorization, intersectionality, and uh, you rightfully said that this is also challenged. But I think this is challenged not by intersectionality thinkers, not so much, but by queer thinkers. So queer theory is particularly questioning uh, the intersectionality framework. Why? Because the intersectionality framework insists on clear identities while uh, why, and identities that are connected to categorization, um, social categorization, while queer theorists uh, question uh, identity itself as a social coercion um, onto individuals. So uh, individuals should not be forced to um, have an identity at all because identity is uh, a, a strategy of domination. Um, still, also um, the beyond categories, that is actually a point in the queer theory, we can find this, and this I find really most interesting of the whole thing, I must admit, uh, that we find this queer questioning of identities and of categorization, which in queer theory, I would say is really a positive thing and a progressive thing. We find that as a regressive thing in anti-Semitism because anti-Semites kind of fight off the threat that their identities, that their own identities might not be fixed, that they might be endangered. So that comes in um, in a very, very subtle manner, comes a queer moment into anti-Semitism uh, so that also within queer theory, it is not easy to grasp anti-Semitism because it's again turned uh, upside down from the feet onto the head. Um, but basically, I understand intersectionality as uh, an analytical framework that tries to position individuals kind of within a, uh, let's say it, uh, the mathematical system, the uh, categorical system. So it depends on which uh, category you are described with in within society, whether you want it or not. And then you are uh, positioned within uh, society. And um, this comes along in um, intersectionality as a political movement with identity politics, so that those identities that are ascribed to individuals shall be celebrated as self-empowering moments. So Black is Beautiful, for example. Uh, and queer um, tries to work against that, tries to uh, disturb this security within identity politics and this. Uh, so queer is actually not part of uh, intersectionality, although I have uh, seen that there is also an anti-categorical intersectional approach going on that exactly questions this um, identity coercion. Thank you. I see that gets uh, more and more complicated if you look into the details. Um, 